It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Nixius NX EDG 27X. As usual, this video accompanies a larger and more technical written review, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. So if you like more technical detail, further analysis on the monitor, certainly check that out. Also be aware that what you see on this video depends on my camera, it depends on the processing done by my video editing software, it depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor looks like first hand. Really it's just there to give some examples to run through various different performance characteristics of the monitor. I mainly focus on in-game examples, but what I'm describing here, particularly when it comes to areas such as contrast and colour reproduction, very much apply, even if you're just on the desktop browsing the internet or something like that. This monitor has a 27-inch AHVA, Advanced Hyper Viewing Angle, IPS type panel. This has a 2560 by 1440, that's WQHD or 1440p resolution. So with this, you get a decent amount of desktop real estate, so it's good for multitasking, that kind of thing. You get decent clarity to text and suitably high resolution image content. It's generally regarded as a nice combination of screen size and resolution for many people. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So as you can see, it has a homely design from the front. It has a rectangular stand base, lots of matte black plastics. There's also a little glossy plastic element for the turntable, which connects the stand base to the stand neck. And a white painted on Nixius logo, or printed Nixius logo in the middle there. The construction of the monitor in general is pretty lightweight. It isn't the most solid actually, you know, it has a bit of a wobble to it. But when I'm just using the monitor normally, I've got it on my desk, I'm typing, I don't have any issues but that may depend on how vigorously you're typing or your desk, that kind of thing. But for me, no issues with that. It also offers good ergonomic flexibility. So you've got tilt, swivel, height, and pivot adjustment. And the exact adjustments can be found in the written review in the features and aesthetics section. There are also some measurements such as how tall the monitor is at the lowest stand height, how deep that stand base is. And it is quite a compact design, which is quite good. So it's not a big desk depth hog or anything like that. Top and side bezels have a dual stage design, so there's a slim panel border that's flush with the rest of the panel, as well as a slender hard plastic outer part. The screen surface is what I just classify as light to very light matte anti-glare. So it offers decent glare handling, not as good as some matte screen surfaces in that respect, but it also means it doesn't impede the image as much as I explore a little later on. And you might also notice some what I describe as a glass-like appearance in some lighting. If you've got strong direct light hitting the screen surface, with stronger matte screen surfaces you'd see more of a diffused patch of glare than this. But either way you want to avoid that strong direct light hitting the screen surface where possible, and this certainly is more effective than a glossy screen surface or a much lighter matte screen surface in terms of its glare handling. At the rear you'll see it's mainly matte black plastic. There are some red elements there. There aren't any LEDs or anything there, they're just red plastic elements. Stand attaches centrally using 100 by 100 millimeter VESA. You can unscrew that stand and attach an alternative 100 millimeter VESA compatible solution if you prefer. At the bottom of the stand neck there is a cable tidy loop. There are also integrated speakers. You can see the speaker grills there. They just offer basic sound output. Explore them a little bit in the written review, but there's really nothing much to say about them. Just basic sound output, not particularly high quality or anything like that. These are the OSD controls. They're explored in the OSD video. It is worth mentioning here, the OSD system is not nice at all on this model. It's actually the worst I've come across. You get used to it to some extent, but even then it's really not very intuitive. There's also a K slot towards the bottom right there. The ports are down firing, meaning they face downwards. You can see there's DC input, so this monitor has an external power brick rather than an internal converter. There are two HDMI 1.4 ports. There's display port 1.2A and HDMI is limited to 144Hz maximum, DisplayPort 1.2 can give you 165Hz maximum. There's adaptive sync support as well, so for HDMI that means AMD FreeSync Premium, and for DisplayPort that's AMD FreeSync Premium as well as NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. There's also a 3.5mm headphone jack, or as they call it here, an earphone output. I'm now in shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to explore the contrast performance of the monitor. This monitor has an IPS type panel, has a specified contrast of 1000 to 1 and I recorded just a smidge below that using my test settings, but the contrast is higher depending on the adjustments you make, so natively it's closer to 1150 to 1. Either way this isn't going to give you a deep atmospheric look to dark scenes which are plentiful on titles like this. 
certainly if you're sitting in a dark room as I am now. But it does give you a bit of an edge over some IPS models just in general when it comes to contrast, such as competing models with LG's Nano IPS panels. They tend to be closer to 700 to 800 to 1, especially after you've corrected the colour channels and things like that. There's also IPS Glow to consider. This is an IPS type panel, an AHVA panel. So this does affect the atmosphere. You'll be able to see that quite readily in the video. Towards the top left of the screen, there's actually a bit of clouding on my unit as well. It has a bit of a backlight uniformity issue. Not all units will have that. That does vary between individual units. So that does bring IPS glow out more strongly. It sort of attracts this bloom of extra IPS glow. But I'm sure many people watching this video will be familiar with IPS glow. It is this sort of haze which emanates from the corners of the screen. From a normal viewing position, it's most noticeable towards the bottom corners but you can see it elsewhere depending on your viewing position and again if you've got a bit of backlight uniformity issue going on for the dark shades. It's also brought out more strongly if you're sitting close to the screen and if you're using a higher brightness setting as well. I've just brightened the room up a bit, quite a lot actually, and you'll now see that this IPS glow doesn't catch the eye in the same way. You can certainly see a little bit of hazing towards the top left, but that's mainly a uniformity issue on my unit. But elsewhere, and just in general, the perceived contrast is much better now. So not only is the IPS glow diminished, but the fact it only has around a thousand to one for the static contrast, it isn't as noticeable in these kind of lighting conditions. I mean, if you compare the darkest shades to the black of the bezel, again, this isn't necessarily clear on the video, but to the eye it is a bit clearer. You, you do notice that the black depth isn't amazing, but again, it's just that edge has taken off the IPS glow and the perceived contrast is much improved compared to sitting in a dark room. So with this said, if you do like to sit in a mainly dark room, I would advise having some light behind the monitor if you can, like a bias light, that kind of thing, it can really help with perceived contrast. For the brighter shades, the screen surface, as I mentioned earlier, is light to very light matte anti-glare, so it doesn't have that kind of smeary look in front of the image, it doesn't have that layered appearance in front of the image, quite direct emission of light from a matte screen surface, and I quite like it in that respect. It also gives you a little bit of a glassy look in some lighting conditions. You could see that when the screen was switched off earlier, but you can also see it when the screen switched on at times. This isn't like a glossy screen surface, don't get me wrong, it's not going to annoy you with reflections all the time, but it is just part of the light to very light matte quality to it, which I actually quite like and some others do as well. In terms of the screen surface texture itself, that's another thing to consider. It's reasonably smooth on this one. It does have a bit of a grainy look to lighter shades, but I'm very sensitive to this. So this is something which most users are going to find is fine on this model because it doesn't have a heavy or smeary graininess. It's more of a light graininess, which most people won't even notice at all. I'm now on Legom, legom.nl, the website and the test for viewing angles. And I'm just going to quickly go through the Legom viewing angles tests because it's nice to talk about colour consistency when I'm looking at monitors. This is an important concept to understand. The Legom text here, it's a blended grey with a dark red striping to it. So that's very consistent throughout the screen. It doesn't have these flashes of green or red or orange. So that indicates a low viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. Perhaps more relatable are these individual colours. This purple block always appears weird on the video, but to the eye it's a pinkish purple throughout. It's fairly consistent perhaps a little bit of extra pink towards the very edge of the screen. I know this is basically the inverse of what you can see on the video. It's very weird for whatever reason on the video. The red block, this appears a rich and vibrant red throughout the screen. Pretty consistent. It doesn't have the kind of shifts in some regions towards a pinker shade or a faded red as models with weaker viewing angle performance would show, particularly VA or TN models. Some IPS models can show it a little bit as well. Towards the very edges, it's perhaps a bit dimmer if I'm being a bit fussy but some IPS models even do show this more significantly than this one does. The green block is a saturated green chartreuse shade throughout, good consistency there. The blue block, good royal blue throughout the screen. I'm now on Battlefield 2042. You heard that correctly, 2042 for a little bit of variety. And I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. Now this monitor's colour gamut, I measured 95% of the DCI P3 colour space. So that means that it extends well beyond sRGB. I actually measured 96% with my AMD graphics card. I'm not entirely sure why, but my AMD graphics card had just a very slightly wider color gamut, but visually it was very similar, so don't really stress about this. But what this means is for content like this, and if you're just browsing the internet casually, or just most content you consume really, it's gonna be designed with the sRGB color space in mind. If you've got a wider color gamut than that, it introduces extra saturation, oversaturation. Some people really like this look. It is very vibrant. 
other people not so much. What I would say is it's not the same as a digital saturation boost, such as if you increase the saturation slider in the OSD of the monitor, or you're using NVIDIA Digital Vibrance or something like that, because what that does is it pulls shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So you lose shade variety by doing that, whereas if you have a wide colour gamut like you do here, you maintain good spacing on the gamut, and therefore you do maintain that shade variety. But things definitely do have an oversaturated look, a vibrant look, a vivid look. So the sky here, for example, it's quite striking. And again, you can't appreciate this on the video properly for the reasons I mentioned earlier, but certainly to the eye, it's fairly striking. Not as striking as some models. Some models have an even wider color gamut. The greens as well, there's a nice variety of greens, some quite nice lush looking greens as well. Some of the yellowish greens for the grass there, they tend to look a bit too yellow, just a little bit neon in places actually, just because of the color gamuts, but not to the extent that you see on some models, particularly those with greater Adobe RGB coverage. They're going to show you a pretty strong neon look to these kind of greens. There's also lots of red energy as well, so the red there, for example, looks very striking. The reds on this poster there, and actually just the, the pinks, really vibrant there, very eye-catching. It does mean that the neutrality is affected though, so for example these park benches, and, and just browns in general, they tend to look a bit too reddish, less neutral than they should look, less subdued than they should. The earth there, this example, is not exactly the best because it actually looks okay, uh, just a little bit too red. Again, not as extreme as on some models, and you get the same with skin tones that can look a little bit oversaturated, a little bit sun-kissed in places. Again, this is a look which some people really like and they're quite used to. We're used to oversaturation with TVs and smartphones these days, or most people are, and it is just a preference. Some people do like it. If you don't, then usually I would talk about an sRGB emulation mode. This monitor doesn't actually have one of those, and I do have an article looking at alternatives that you can use at the GPU level, and you can do this with this model. Unfortunately, it doesn't offer very good sRGB coverage, at least it didn't on my unit, so that isn't ideal either. There's not really a way to sort of get proper sRGB coverage on this monitor unless you have a colorimeter and you're using color aware applications, which mean they're going to be using gamut mapping, so that does not include games like this anyway. I explore this more in the color reproduction section of the Vision Review if you're interested in the technicalities, but really what I'm saying here is it's not ideal that this monitor doesn't have an sRGB emulation setting. If you're using this monitor for colour critical work, again, if you've got your own colour imager or similar device, then you can profile it. That's not a problem. You'll get rid of the oversaturation gamut mapping for the colour aware applications that you're using. And the DCI P3 coverage at 95, 96%, it's pretty good as well. So if you want to work within a DCI P3 colour space, it gives you good potential there. The Adobe RGB coverage for those interested, it's much lower. I recorded 86 to 87 percent Adobe RGB, so it's not really good enough for accurate work within that color space. This one's really more suited for DCI P3 and sRGB content. And just coming back to that saturation slider I mentioned, there is a saturation slider in the OSD. I'm just going to cover this very quickly. So you can reduce that if you want a less saturated look. The problem is that some shades really appear rather oversaturated, still like that red there. It's actually still oversaturated. And by this point, I'm at 33, you don't have to make such dramatic adjustments. I just did this to try and sort of prove a point. But some shades appear really muted, so it's really very difficult to get the balance right. So it isn't the same as having an sRGB emulation mode or anything like that. But if you do want to reduce the saturation a bit, you can use that control. And just a final note, I did mention colour consistency using Legom. That applies here as well, so there's good saturation levels and richness maintained throughout the screen. I'm now on Battlefield 5. The reason I'm not on Battlefield 2042 is simply for performance and consistency reasons. So I'm talking about responsiveness, and I do like to have this running at a good solid 165 frames a second. You can see that in the top right there, 165, or hopefully you can see that little green number. And with this, this monitor is outputting up to 2.75 times as much information every second as a 60 hertz monitor, or indeed this monitor running at 60 hertz. You also see some little interlaced lines in places. That's just from the camera, more away from the camera rather than anything that's visible on the monitor itself. So you get two main advantages with this. I'd highly recommend reading the article on the website all about monitor responsiveness, and that's linked to and sort of summarized in the written review in the responsiveness section for a bit of background reading. But essentially this high refresh rate, high frame rate combination does two things for you. It improves the connected feel. That describes the fluidity and the precision when you're interacting with the game world. That's very good in this case. 
That's also something which is aided by low input lag. In this case, very low input lag. I measured around two and a half milliseconds. So that indicates a very low signal delay, and that's the element of input lag you feel. That's the sort of main element people consider when they think about input lag. So that's really good in that respect as well. The other advantage of this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it greatly reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement. So perceived blur, again, this is explored in more technical detail in the written review and in the article I mentioned. It's really your eye movement that causes most of the perceived blur you see, and this is linked to the refresh rate. But pixel responses are also important, and this monitor does very well overall in that respect. It has a very flexible pixel overdrive. It actually has a pixel overdrive slider. We can set between zero and 100 in increments of one, so there's great flexibility there. And it's gonna flash up some pursuit photographs on the screen, which will give you a little bit of a visual indication of what we're working with here. So there's a quite a lot to take in because of the flexibility you've got with the overdrive. And again, this is explored in a lot more detail in the written review, but essentially I've picked values there mainly between 0 and 50, various different values. The reason I've picked them is because above 50 you just get too much overshoot, too much inverse ghosting. And I actually like using the monitor at a setting of 12. The reason for that is if you look at the pictures that I've just shown you at 165 hertz, there's not actually very much difference between 0, 12 and 24. But when the refresh rate lowers, as it does in a variable refresh rate environment, as I'll come on to shortly, then 12 actually maintains really good balance throughout the variable refresh rate range. So I like to use that. Everyone has their own sensitivity and their own preferences when it comes to overshoot versus conventional trailing. But with a setting of 12, you can see from that that actually this monitor comfortably outperforms the Gigabyte M27Q. And I've used that as a reference there because that is a display which most people are very comfortable with in terms of its pixel responsiveness. This one, even set to 12, actually quite a bit better than that. So there are some slight weaknesses, a little bit of faint powder trailing. You can see that in the pursuit photographs. You can also see this just more broadly by eye, but it really is a slight amount of powder trailing. And by this, I mean this little bit that sticks very close to the object itself and is much fainter than the object itself. And in this scene here, this monitor does perform most transitions very rapidly and performs really nicely at 165 hertz. Gives a good solid 165 hertz experience. So the weaknesses are far too slight for me to be able to show you in the video. It's something like that smeary trailing you typically see on VA models, and it's not like the kind of more extensive powdery trailing you might see on some slower IPS models either. It's mainly for the dark or the very bright transitions. So for this text here, for example, there's a bit of that going on. Again, most people aren't going to notice this, but I do like to just point it out anyway. And for the very dark shades, such as the dark environment there, there's a little bit of this going on. And I do stress a little bit. Most people, again, are not going to notice it. It only really contributes a small amount to the overall perceived blur. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5, and this one is dominated more by dark shades. So there are more transitions which this monitor would I would say struggle a little bit with. I use the word struggle loosely because it actually performs very well, even so. Again, just slight amount of light powdery trailing in places. It's again faint. It's not something which is a major contributor to perceived blur or that most people are going to notice at all. And again, lower than what you see on the Gigabyte M27Q. But I do like to use this scene anyway as, it's, as it sometimes shows more distinct weaknesses than I'm seeing here. And there's also nothing to complain about in the way of overshoot here. I would have mentioned it if anything came up, but not just in this scene, but just more generally gives a nice low overshoot experience if you've got the overdrive set to a, what I consider to be a sensible level, as I do here, set to 12. If I'm going to nitpick, and I do like a bit of nitpicking, I would say that it would be ideal if this monitor focused more on accelerating some of the slower transitions it performs. And again, they're not slow, they're just relatively slow, slower than the fastest transitions it performs. So those ones with the dark shades and the much brighter shades, if it could speed them up without pulling the other shades and creating a lot of overshoot elsewhere. Again, this is explored in more detail in the written review, so definitely check that out if you're interested in this. The monitor also supports VRR, variable refresh rate, in the form of adaptive sync. So you can use AMD FreeSync Premium if you've got a compatible AMD system, or you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode if you've got a compatible NVIDIA GPU. That's what I'm using at the moment, an RTX 3090, but I have also tested this with an AMD GPU, and the experience was very similar. The range of operation, it's slightly different. So it's 30 to 165 hertz on the AMD side. On the NVIDIA side, it seemed to be 38 to 
165 hertz, but when you go below the floor of operation, it uses LFC, low frame rate compensation, or a similar technology for NVIDIA. It's just an AMD trademark, but it's basically the same thing. That keeps tearing and stuttering at bay by keeping to a multiple of the frame rate and the refresh rate. I also sometimes comment that when LFC kicks in, there's a sort of a boundary, and when you pass it in either direction, there can sometimes be slight subtle stuttering. In this case, the frame rate at which it occurs is so low that that actually masks the stuttering very effectively with this low frame rate judder. So you can't really see that, you can't notice it at all really. So that's really good. The other thing that's really good is the, the really the operation is pretty seamless for adaptive sync. And by that, I mean that it doesn't have a lot of overshoot, even at the very lowest end of refresh rate. So I'm just gonna turn the graphic settings up a little bit. So I've now got things in the double digits just, so it's around 100 frames a second, a little bit lower than that. And sometimes with adaptive sync, unless you change the overdrive setting, you would actually see some quite noticeable overshoot. In this case, there's a little bit of overshoot, but I do stress that it's just a little bit. It's not gonna be eye-catching for most people at all. It's not gonna be a problem for most people. Nothing that really is gonna come across on the video even. But adaptive sync's doing its thing. It's getting rid of tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches. So without this, I would be getting tearing if I had vSync disabled, or I'd be getting stuttering if I had vSync enabled. So I do like having those interruptions removed as someone sensitive to tearing and stuttering. I've now got things running at 60 frames a second, and again, not a lot of overshoot, a little bit of a little bit of halo trailing in places, for example, around that tree, but these transitions here, these are sort of worst case in terms of the overshoot on this model, and even then, really nothing particular to speak of, nothing particularly eye-catching or anything like that. So. It's nicely tuned here. The manufacturer does claim it has variable overdrive, but I think, I mean, I'm being a bit pedantic here, but what I would say is actually it's a natively a very fast panel and it works well with just a low level of acceleration. And this low level of acceleration isn't sufficient to cause obvious overshoot at any refresh rate that it will run at. So that's really what it's doing here. It isn't really variable overdrive in the sense that you'd get with an NVIDIA G-Sync module where you'd get everything tuned very carefully across the range, but either way, it's a good solution. It does work well. And with this drop in frame rate, yes, you do notice a decrease in that connected feel, and there's a significant increase in perceived blur due to eye movement as well. That's not something that variable refresh rate technologies can help with, but again, the tearing and stuttering is not there. I've now got the monitor running at 40 hertz. I've got the game running at 40 frames a second. And even here, not a lot of overshoot. Yes, a little bit does creep in, a little bit more actually than at 60 hertz. But to be honest, it's not really a main distraction at such low frame rates. Just the low frame rate itself feels quite horrendous, if I'm honest, compared to much higher frame rates. So if you're down here, you're not really going to be finding the overshoot bothersome, which is good, but you're probably going to be finding the frame rate itself a bit bothersome. So overall, quite a lot of boxes ticked when it comes to responsiveness from this monitor. It doesn't have a strobe backlight setting, that's one thing um, I know some people do like to see, but it's not offered in this case. To wrap up then, the monitor offers fairly basic build quality, but it does offer good ergonomic flexibility. The OSD is probably my main complaint when it comes to the features and aesthetics of the monitor. It doesn't have a great number of ports either. It doesn't have any USB ports and it doesn't have USB-C functionality. The OSD itself is also quite cut back in terms of its feature set when you compare it to some competing models such as the Gigabyte M27Q. When it comes to the contrast performance, Nothing really to shout about there. It's really as expected. It is better than some competing models with LG's Nano IPS technology. For colour reproduction, it provides vibrant and consistent colour output, has a generous colour gamut. It doesn't offer any sRGB emulation, so you are actually stuck with that colour gamut. In most cases, I mean, you can profile the monitor and do that for colour-aware applications, but outside of that, for example, when you're gaming, it can become a little bit more problematic if you don't like that kind of look. It would have been nice to have an sRGB emulation setting as an option for users who want to use that kind of thing. On the responsiveness side, good low input lag, very low signal delay, very flexible overdrive control as well, and good tuning using quite a low setting there, and a low setting which meant that it didn't produce a strong overshoot, even if it was running at a low refresh rate. And that's important for VRR, variable refresh rate. The VRR range of operation of 30 to 165 hertz or 38 to 165 hertz depending on your GPU 
that's a really good range and it worked very nicely and having the entire range without strong overshoot it is certainly a very welcome thing so you know on balance there is quite a lot to like about this monitor would i recommend it that's a difficult question to be honest this is quite a hot segment there are a lot of competing models which you could consider as well. Rather than going through that all here, I will link to a thread which covers them in the description of the video. And I'll actually link specifically to a post in that thread which compares this model to the Gigabyte M27Q, which is really my main recommendation. But that isn't to say I don't recommend this model. You know, it does have some quirks and the feature set isn't as extensive as the Gigabyte either. And it is actually more expensive than the Gigabyte. But if you just really want vibrant colour output and you really just want a solid experience when it comes to responsiveness without having to worry about overshoot at different refresh rates that kind of thing a good solid VRR experience then this model may well be what you're after. So that's really all there is to the Nixius NX EDG 27X. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.